Good evening, Sport Prelim Qualifiers. Myself, Ishita, your host for VSSF Sport webinars. On behalf of VSSF Sport, let me extend our warmest congratulations to the schools, principals, science teachers, and all you students for having qualified the National Sport Prelims 2022-23. The extra time, effort, and hard work that you put in has paid off and you could be delighted of the fact that you are one amongst the top science talents shortlisted from across the country. Before we proceed, let me please reiterate the housekeeping rules that I shared during the last session. This session would last for 45 minutes. Mobile phones to be on switched off mode. Request all students to actively listen and participate in the session. Questions from this session could be a part of spot final exam, except for spot basic students. Please do not doodle on the screen, chat, nor spam. If found otherwise, we will be restricting your participation from this webinar. We shall commence the session in the next couple of minutes. Space has intrigued mankind, an ever-developing topic of study. Astronomy is rich with exploration, opportunities, and unanswered questions. Research and discovery results reg regularly alter what we think we know about the space. Understanding the elements of our world helps to develop better understanding and appreciation of the Earth's fragility and the importance of preserving our environment. The more we understand the processes on Earth and other planets, the better we can protect the only planet found so far that can sustain life. Let us get to know more about the unknown. Respected principals, teachers, and students, I'm delighted to introduce and welcome Dr. Srijit A.J., Edwin Schrodinger, fellow and scientist, University of Colorado, USA. On completion of his PhD and MTech, from Indian Institute of Astrophysics. Dr. Srijit was a full-time research scholar and postdoctoral researcher at Indian Institute of Astrophysics, Bangalore. He then moved to the Space Research Institute, Austrian Academy of Science, as the postdoctoral fellow focusing on exoplanet characterization and observation. We are overjoyed to have you with us, sir. Now, may I please welcome Dr. Srijit to address the spot talents on today's session, Planets and Beyond. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. So I'll share my screen and uh, start the presentation. If that's okay. Yes, sir. So uh, I would need permission to share my screen because
I hope uh, everyone good up. Good yeah. morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I hope you can see my screen properly. And um, so I would like to start off with the question of whether how important it is to understand the scale of things. So when we look at this photograph, we normally assume that the, the aeroplanes are this big, that there are like hundreds of humans in there. But when we look at it much more closer and we have a context of things, we understand that this was like an extremely small aircraft, which is a modern toy aircraft. So what I would like to bring in point of view that things which we see or things we understand from our surrounding, they are most, we can only understand the size and scale of things based on some reference point that we understand. So for example, this image was taken by an aircraft, like when it was flowing past, as you can see the rings of Jupiter and the pale blue dot we see here, is actually the Earth, the Earth as viewed from really far off. So in order to better understand this, I would like to take you on a journey from, from Earth to Australia. So we are starting from Rome, sorry, we are starting from Venice, and the circles that these people are holding is one meter in diameter. So that's going to be our dimension of scale. So we are going to start from one meter, and in each step we are going to be 10 times bigger. So now the people, the, the people who are moving around it, so people who are standing and watching it, they are at 10 meters. So that's like 10 times 1 meter. So as we move out, we are moving 10 times each time. And with each step, we are moving out from our world, that is Earth, into the, into, into the space to see that how big that is. So, so now we are at 100 meters. So that covers the entire city center of that part. 1,000 meters covers most of the city's inner circle. And as we move out, we see the islands of Venice and, the, uh, and we start to see parts of Italy. And once we are really out of it, like the entire continent of Europe comes into view. And as we move out and out, like the entire planet that we reside on comes to view. So at around 10 raised to 7 meters, we are almost at a stage where like everything, everyone we know, every everything we know is contained within this 10 raised to 7 meters. And we have to even go further of another 10 to 100 meters, 10 to 100 times if we have to reach our nearest object that we know of where humans have been, the furthest humans have ever been the moon. So moving, moving further and further out, we are reaching the realms of where humans have gone the maximum in their in their likelihood so that is the move and as we move further further out the planets comes into view our solar system comes into view so we will start seeing our planets nearby to us mars mars venus jupiter and as we move further and further we see that the star that star that gives us everything the sun sun which is like really an enormous object near us is an extremely small object in the vast scheme of things. So at around 10 raised to 12, 10 raised to 13 meters, we are at a stage where the entire solar system would be, we are, reach, we are reaching the edges of the solar system at 10 raised to 13 meters. So this is kind of like 10 raised to 13, 10 raised to 14 meters is where the maximum anything which are sent by humans have been flown to. So the Voyager spacecraft did flew past solar system a couple of years ago. And this is the maximum that anything that is man-made has gone by. So now we go for like we, our scale kind of like changes into light years because like we are going to bigger values and it is easier to understand in light years. So from this point onwards, the light takes almost one year to reach our surface. We start seeing nearby stars and at this distance, it is like really difficult to distinguish sun and its nearby star. Like that's like really, we are really far off. So as we move further, we see that our star is not just one star, a collection, but a, but a part of a group of stars at the edge of a foggy star. So we are moving really far away and we are at around 1,000 light years. And we see that this, this collection of stars is part of a gigantic object, which is like a collection of millions and millions of stars. And hence, we have reached part of our galaxy, the Milky Way. So, and we also find that we are kind of like one of the edges of the galaxy and we are not even at the center of the galaxy. So this kind of like changes our perceived notions of how big we are or how important we are. And moving further, we start to see other galaxies. 
and at around 1000 light years we see that we are not this like the number of galaxies are also significantly increasing so as there are millions of stars in a galaxy there are millions of galaxies in our universe and going further and further out we reach that stage where we are reaching the edges of non universe or the universe that we know so far and from there we are almost at 10 raised to 26 to 10 raised to 27 meters. So that's like a huge, huge number from where we started at one meter. So it's like, so 10, it's like 27 zeros after one. So you can imagine how vast the things are. And from there, at this grand vast image of where all the galaxies are bundled up together, it's kind of like the, <clears throat> the oldest or the furthest image that we can create of our universe. And from there, we kind of like are planning to go back into where we are and how we came about this. So to understand planets and exoplanets, like first, I would like to just give you a brief introduction of astronomy and how astronomy started. So, so astronomy started basically. So if you imagine this, people who live long back, our ancient ancient human beings, like they would have looked up and see that there was different things changing. They would observe that. There's a bright, bright ball of light which comes up, comes up at some time. And when that light comes up, it is like really warm. There's like enough light. And when it goes up, goes away, there is another ball of light that comes up, which is like fainter, which is cooler. So they would have divided things into day and night based on that. They would have also noticed that at when when the night time comes, like there are multiple small stars in the sky, small things in the sky, and these would this would they would have associated them with different shapes. And then they would have noticed that seasons change with respect to the stars in the sky. So they would have started associating seasons and things, seasons and how these how these uh, how these stars change and that would help them to make an idea of how time passes. And from that, by the medieval time, like both Medieval times, both in India and outside, like they, they, they started having numerous discussion about like studying astronomy in general, using telescopes to study, using different methods to measure time. So, for example, there is like astrolabe here, which is being used used in ancient Persia to measure time. We have uh, sun time measuring devices in Jaipur. Uh, there are sundials. Copernicus was one of the first persons who suggested that. Uh, like Earth is Earth, Earth is not the center of the universe, but Earth is moving around the sun. Galileo used telescope to look at the moon. We have Kepler's law, which 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 helps understand how planets move around the sun. And so, with all these, like the idea of astronomy and how we study came into being. So, the basic principle what we are looking at is light. So we are our aim is to so what we can see from these objects is light, and from this light we try to understand these objects. So, depending upon the color of light, I don't know whether you're aware of what a prism is. So, prism is a device which will split the light into different colors or wavelengths. So, for example, if you, if you put a prism on the sunlight, you can see the rainbow. So, depending upon, but, but there are colors which are further from here as well, which we can't see. So, colors beyond here, we have ultraviolet and other, other radiations here. And we also have infrared, it's like beyond red and other colors here. So, by splitting a light, we can see the colors, and then with that, we can study what are the properties of these objects, whether they are stars, galaxies, planets, etc. So, this is because any object that 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 has like everything, including us, we all emit some form of light. So, and the, the light, the color of the light that we emit depends upon what temperature we are. So, the hotter we are, we will be emitting temperatures which are bluer in color. So, for example, if you have looked at the gas gas light, the, the part where it blows the hotter is more bluer and where the temperature is less is more redder. So, blue is more hotter than red. And if you go further, ultraviolet will be more hot. Ultraviolet is more hot than blue. X-rays are much more hotter than ultraviolet. Gamma rays are much more hotter. And if you go in the other direction, infrared will be cooler, etc., etc. So this gives us an idea about what the temperature of the object is by looking at the color of the object. So, and so so different ob so so different objects will have different temperatures that will enable us to understand what is the size of these objects, 
what, what is the color of these objects and on top of that this another thing like uh, which is important here is that so so the students who are who are like in maybe in 10th standard and those students would know that we know we have we have the atomic model where the electrons go around the center nucleus in different different states so what happens is that when electrons move from one state to another what happens is that there is like so in order for the electrons to move from a lower energy to a higher energy it needs energy so it absorbs energy from outside and if it is moving down from an upper energy to a lower energy it will emit energy so based on these what happens is that when it absorbs energy and emits energy these will be in different movements because ener as as we saw before energy or temperature is equivalent to light and wavelength so so depending upon these like whether whether an element is like whether an electron is going in one direction or the other we'll be able to know and this depends on the type of the element so different elements will have different energies when it goes from one state to another so because of that by doing spectroscopy or by looking at this splitting of light into different colors and looking at them we will be able to see what all elements are there in that or uh, uh, what are the elements in that particular object that we are if we are looking at a star we'll understand whether which elements are there if you're looking at a planet or an atmosphere of a planet we'll know which all elements or molecules are there so that's what we do another thing which you have to understand now before we go into the details is something called a doppler effect doppler effect is an easy easy thing to understand so if you have if you stand on a railway platform for a train to train to come and the train passes through you you will you will and train this train has its horn on you will see that as it comes by the the the, the sound of the horn changes as the train passes in front of you it is the same thing with the effect of an ambulance if you are standing on the road and an ambulance or a police vehicle with siren passes through as the vehicle comes closer to you the 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 the, the sound changes and then it changes as it goes away this effect of shift in change of frequency this is because the sound waves the frequency changes and this is this principle is known as doppler effect and this is not just restricted to sound it can happen also for light so what happens is that if there is an object which is moving moving closer to you the object will be blue shifted because it's like closer to the so it's so it's it's going to be shorter wavelength and if it is moving away from you it will be red shifted because it has longer wavelengths so similar to the doppler so doppler effect is observable not on sound not only on sound but also on light so how do we observe these objects so we use telescopes to observe so there are two kind of uh, major telescope that people use one is reflector and one is refractor refracted telescopes are the ones which you are not you would normally associate what a telescope would look like where you look through an a small eyepiece and there is some lenses which kind of like focuses the light and you can see the object through there but most of the uh, actual astronomy that happens use reflector telescopes because like it's easier to build bigger mirrors than bigger lenses because it is difficult to build bigger lenses so we usually build bigger mirrors and bigger telescope with that and use reflector telescopes to understand that so on on the topic and you, you also know that can't observe all wavelengths from the ground this is because like our atmosphere in, in order to protect as well kind of like blocks many wavelengths from reaching to the earth surface for example ultraviolet radiation x rays gamma rays these radiations are really bad for humans like it's not it's not good for you so what happens is that in our atmosphere these are blocked at different layers like usually at stratosphere or above stratosphere and because of that what happens is that you won't be able to observe these wavelengths on the ground so what we will be able to observe on the ground is visible radiation that is like whatever we can see with our eye that's like the colors and in and little bit of infrared that is also because like you feel that when you go out into the sun you feel the warmth of the sun right that is because that because of the infrared radiation from the sun so but some of the infrared radiations are also blocked by the clouds uh, so lower level atmosphere so what we do is that we observe radio waves are radio waves reach ground and that's why we can use radio waves for communication so usually radio telescopes and optical telescopes usually they are on the ground where we can observe them and then we have other telescopes either in the sky so we have we have telescopes in in aeroplanes on balloons a satellites to observe other waves that is because look as i told you like because of earth's atmosphere at absorbing different radiations which is preventing it from uh, proper observations uh, 
uh, from the ground. So now let's start looking at solar system. So from this, we go into looking at our solar system. And for this, as, as I told you, why we need to observe in different wavelengths, because like we see different wavelengths and we see different things. So starting off, you'll see what all are the instruments that we use. So this is like the radio telescope that we have uh, that we use to observe. These are deep dish antennas, which kind of like collects light. Then we have optical telescope. This is like in India, this is in, in the Tamil Nadu, this is like Kavalu telescope. This, this again in India, in uh, Himalaya, this is the Himalaya Chandra telescope. These are both optical telescopes. So this is the inside of a telescope. So you see that there are mirrors there which are observing. This is another telescope which is again on the ground called the SDSS. It's kind of like for a survey. Then you have balloon experiments where you have huge balloons where you have payloads that are carrying these balloons and then you observe with these balloons. Then you go into the space to observe. Bigger. So the most famous example of a space telescope is Hubble Space Telescope, which has been observing for a long time. In ultraviolet, we use telescopes like Galax. India also has, uh, so this is Chandra, Chandra Telescope observing in X-ray, which is named after as Chandrasekhar, a famous Indian scientist. You also have uh, web uh, satellites which observe in far and real ultraviolet, which are used to, this is the like Kobe experiment, which is like used to observe cosmic microwave observation. So from this, like from all these observations from different wavelengths and this, what we understand so far is like, we have a good understanding of how stars form, what are the life cycle of stars. So we know that, sorry, once again. Give me a moment. Sorry for that. Yeah, we have a good understanding of how stars form and how stars die. So we know that stars, any type of stars are formed from something known as protostar, which are formed from some stellar nucleus, like where there is a lot of gas, dust, and a lot of particles. The so stars from this, initially there are protostars. So they usually kind of like take different approaches into stars. Like so they can go as like big stars, like blue supergiant, like blue stars, like really hot, which kind of like stay in that period for a short time. Or they can go into another another route where they're like sun-like stars and then they slowly die down. So, so then coming back to solar system, which is like our solar system. So if we we understand a great deal about our solar system as well. And as you know, the the source of all energy and the thing that is holding our solar systems together is the sun, our sun. So a close look at the sun reveals that there are like a lot of spectacles, a lot of uh, solar activity, solar spots, things happening on the sun. And as we move away from the sun, the sun slowly changes into that familiar ball of light that we know, like the faint yellowish, orangish, faint color thing that we see which piece of warmth and light. And we reach the first planet, Mercury, which doesn't have any atmosphere. And hence, you can see that there are like craters on the surface of Mercury. So Mercury Mercury revolves really close to the sun. And because of that, it is like extremely hospitable. And as you move away, we reach Venus, which can be considered a twin of Earth because of the size of Venus. But things are extremely dif different in Venus. Like Venus, Venus is where acid rains. There is like, methane gas everywhere. So it, it is it is how if things so even though it is like really similar to us, it's like really difficult different because because of how things changed in the past there. So a small change could have led Earth to be something like me. So I, 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 I don't know whether you have noticed, but there was a comet which passed by. And as we move further down we see moon, our our own our 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 own satellite. And again, because it doesn't have an atmosphere, it is kind of like impacted by a lot of craters. And as we move past moon, we slowly reach, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, we reach Earth, our own planet. Uh, the pay, it's, it's also called the play blue dot because like it's like blue in color. We see the planets 
it's kind of like an optimum distance where water can exist in liquid form which is enabling life on these planets so moving further down further out of these planets we move to the next planet mars the red planet which is also which is also a planet where we have used different we have traveled extensively and looked at these planets in detail uh, we have studied these planets and moving further we see the asteroid belt and we start to see bigger planets so we start seeing moons of jupiter and then jupiter comes into view so the planets which we saw till mars are kind of considered are planets which are rocky planets so they have a rocky surface they have like rock on their surface like so these planets are called rocky planets because like they have a rocky surface and then there is like an atmosphere around it even even though it's like really small for mars but now the planets that we see are going to be gas giants and icy worlds so gas giants are planets where it's like entirely gas so you have to go into the core of the planet if you have to actually see if they have a rock surface or so they are like huge planets which are like just filled with gas so we have then after we further go down we all will also see icy planets where it's like extremely cold that everything is in the form of ice so then we start seeing saturn saturn comes into view and the rings of the saturn and then as we move further down we see uranus and if we move further we see neptune and then we start seeing pluto and pluto's other planets and by the end of it by the edge of it we start seeing the end of so what we see are where where the comets come from that's low earth cloud and then we slowly reach so this this is there's something called the edge of solar system it's what we call the edge of solar system it's called earth cloud so it is where we assume most of our comets originate so and from there we we are we are really great observing this sun is kind of like a well studied object and as you can see that sun looks completely different in different wavelengths this is because by observing in different wavelengths we will be able to observe different parts of the sun different layers of the sun and different activities in the sun so so this is like different observations of the sun in different wavelengths and as you can see the activities of the sun are like really prominent in some wavelengths it is less prominent in other wavelengths so so the orange is something the image that we normally see of the sun that that's similar to the one which we can see with our eyes and as you go into different wavelengths you will see that we we probe different parts of the sun and hence we study different parts of the sun so as i told you mars is one of the object that we have studied in detail and that is because of a lot of rovers that we have so this kind of like an image of mars image of image that was taken by one of the rovers the mars selfie with the rover itself and this is one example of this kind of like the first self propelled flight from mars so it was like done in 2020 2020 so where uh, scientists launched a small drone like object from the surface of mars and they were able to bring it down as you can see it kind of like flew from the surface of the mars and then it came so 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 far with our missions, like from different space agencies, like all over the world, including NASA, ESA, ISRO, uh, Japanese space agencies, Russian, uh, Chinese, like all of these people involved, like we have, we have, we have studied the sun. We have been, we have kind of like passed through. What is it called? That there is a mission called Parker Solar Probe, which kind of like went through really close to the sun. But in principle, we we could say that we went inside the sun. But so we have missed. Uh, we have missions to the mercury venus earth mars jupiter moons of jupiter uh, saturn moons of saturn uranus neptune pluto we have been to uh, asteroids we have been to comets and we have also just started going beyond our solar system so from all these observations so far like we have a we have a really good understanding of how our solar system is we understand that the inside of the solar system like close to the sun, close to the sun we have the rocky planets and as we move we have the gas giants and the icy worlds so we know that this is how our solar system is like we know what happens in our solar system we understand most of the 
most of the planets we understand what all process happens in these planets and from our observations so far we also as i told you before we also understand how stars forms and how they evolve so as i told you stars usually forms from planetary nebulae so from star forming nebulae from there they can usually take two steps so as if, if they are sun like stars from a photostar they become a sun like star and they they remain a sun like star for billions of years so they remain in that state for billions of years and then after that what happens is that the process which holds the star the do not hold anymore and they slowly start to expand and become something known as a red giant so once they become red giant what happens is that they are like really huge for example the star known as betelgeuse uh, it's it's one of the stars in the orion nebula uh, it's it's kartika in local uh, local indian languages in most of the local indian languages it's called Kar- kartika kartika so it's kind of like it's it's a red giant star and it would we would be able to see the explosion of that star anytime soon it's a red super giant star so what happens is that once it's a red giant star what happens is that after some time it won't be able to hold anymore and what happens is that slowly the outer outer shell is kind of like goes away for sun like stars and it forms something known as planetary nebula so inside of the star remains as a white dwarf and it remains like white dwarf for a very 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 long time so whatever remains of this planetary nebula kind of like goes into formation of new stars in another case when it is not like a sun like star and it's like a massive star like for example a blue star or a white star like it's like really big so what happens is that when they form a massive star because they are really huge they are less stable so they only remain in that state for millions of years and after that they change into a red super giant and usually because they are so big and when when they are not able to hold any more they kind of like explode and that explosion turns into a supernova so the inside of the star in these case usually turns into either neutron stars or black holes so because they because the gravity is so strong that it's like really hard for things to escape so if it is like really strong they will turn into black hole but if it's like in between black they can change into a neutron star also and whatever remaining explosion that comes out of the supernova again leads to formation of new stars and star forming the so from our understanding so this is the normal periodic table that the, the universe that what are the elements that we have discovered but for astronomers it's kind of like slightly skewed because the majority of majority of the element elements that we see in our in our universe is hydrogen because stars are made up of hydrogen and helium and helium so the major components are hydrogen and helium and then we see all other elements little bit of all other elements which are formed during different process and stuff so everything except for hydrogen and helium we call them metals generally we call all of them other than hydrogen and helium metals and if i speak they talk we found metals or we are talking about metals it would include anything other than hydrogen and helium all the elements other than hydrogen and helium. so how do how do how do you look at stars so So this is this is this is the, like the most easy object that we can look at the night sky and see this is the Orion Nebula so where you can see the or belt of Orion and the tail of Orion you see the you see the you see three stars here the two stars here Orion Nebula is one of the easiest object that you can look at the night sky and identify and as you see here there's a small small kind of like cloudy hazy thing it's like visible with naked eye if 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 it's like really clear you can see it as a small cloud like object and if you zoom in there you see that it's a huge star forming region called as orion nebula and if you even zoom in there further we see that there are like numerous regions where new stars are forming and these are all star forming regions so this is another another clear example of where a nebula where stars are formed this is another example ah uh, this is crab nebula so this this is what is remaining after a big explosion a supernova explosion and this supernova explosion was actually observed from earth this happened before we had records but this was this happened in earth i think few centuries like it was before 1000 ad but this is like a recorded in most of the places so chinese astronomers recorded it a uh, few of the indian astronomers recorded it a uh, few people elsewhere as well so this 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 explosion and formation of crab nebula was like so and in in the middle of this crab nebula we also have a pulsar which is an object which kind of like 
kind of like pulse it's a pulsating star and you can see the signal from the stars once every time and these pulses are extremely accurate so from this we have an understanding of how our universe form so we understand that uh, universe form formed with the big bang and then initially there was an inflation and after that we have we don't know what happened then stars started forming then galaxies started forming and then and now we have the expansion of the universe and this would be the oldest image of the universe that we have so far so this is like what we call the cosmic microwave background this kind of like it's kind of like a temperature map of the oldest time of the universe so apart from what we discussed so far there are like interesting things in the universe like as i mentioned for example pulsars which are pulsating stars so which, which gives which, which can act as timekeepers so there is black holes which you all would have heard of which is capable of hitting things there's like neutron stars which are really strong that things is really hard for things to escape so there's like blazars uh, which which are like which are really really massive object, objects which 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 has high energy radiations so and this is just 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 to give a kind of this is the the most clearest image of a black hole that we have which was taken a few years back by the Venus Horizon Telescope collaboration using telescope all over the world and 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 with simulation so the question arises how do we observe this we use telescopes i told you that we use telescopes the telescopes i showed you before were the telescope that are existing so now i'll show you some of the telescopes that are going to be built so for example this is uh, the 30 meter telescope which is planned to be built in hawaii which india is part of so it's a huge telescope and so the the, the images that you hear here are of large telescope so this is the top you have the extremely large telescope and then you have uh the giant gmt the, uh, the giant magellanic telescope so how to, to to give an understanding of this so so size of these telescopes so what you see here the the the, the small thing here is a basketball court and the tennis court and the telescope that we have are like really small telescopes now so the telescope which we have would be of p sizes so the telescope that i showed you is a p size is a small telescope the current telescope that we have over the world are of a b telescope p sizes the kate telescopes a double telescope we have the gtc these telescopes are of small telescopes and now the bigger telescope that are going to be built are of b sizes so you can you can just imagine how big the telescope is going to be so the telescopes are so huge because like the more bigger the telescope is more light we can collect the more light we can collect the more fainter object we can see the faintest object we can see means that the further in distance that we can see you also have james webb telescope which was recently launched which is like kind of like observing from space uh few so it's it, it's it's really far off from earth and it's like observing in infrared wavelengths future plans include lovar telescope uh which is which is planned for launch after 2035 which would kind of like seriously improve uh observation like as you can see in the images here the only man made object to have fall really far off is the voyager space plan so these were intended for like a short mission but they were launched early in the in the 20th century like in the second half of the 20th century but they are still op operational so they have they have flown past most of the planets and now they are like out of the solar system so and they also have an interesting thing called as a recordon so it's kind of like a metal plate where different things have been created to understand that this came from earth and how to read it and etc it also state the position of earth with respect to different pulses so this this is to give an idea of where earth is with respect to other objects so that if someone finds it they can they can kind of like understand where this object came from and voyager was the first object to look back at at earth when it was like really far away uh, and that's where the first image of earth was taken from really far away so this is that image. and that this was the first time first this was the first idea when we thought of earth as a pale blue dot so now we talked about astronomy and what we know so far and now i would like to take you on a journey from earth to planets where things are things are extremely different so our exoplanets so exoplanets are planets that revolves around stars that is other than sun 
so anything that revolves so any planet that go we call things that revolves around the sun as planets but anything that goes around other planets are exoplanets so how difficult it is to observe exoplanets so let's assume that we have a lighthouse in let's assume one of the coastal cities let's assume it's in kochi so and then we have a firefly which is going around the lighthouse so our aim is to observe this firefly going around this lighthouse with a telescope but it is complicated by the fact that if our lighthouse is in kochi or in kerala the, the the telescope is in delhi so we have to observe something that is like that far away with a telescope it's like that, that far away with that small object so for that we use two metrics one of this one of it's called transit method and another is called radial velocity so radial velocity is like watching for a bubble so this method make use of the principle of doppler velocity what happens is that when an a planet moves around the star like the planet the star has a pull of the gravitational pull on the planet but even though the planet is small it also has a small gravitational pull because of this gravitational pull the star kind of like goes around in a small a small really small circle and depending upon the size and the mass of the planet this wobble can be so and if you look so as i told you what happens is that so if if you look at this properly so if if, if there is a star which is really going around some object and we are observing the star and if it is in this field of view the star will be moving away and towards us right because it's going around in a small circle and when that happens what happens is that the, the, the because of i told you about the doppler effect the vel, the, the velocity slowly redshift and blue shift by measuring that shift we'll be able to understand if there is a planet and we'll be able to understand the size of the planet the first planet discovered 51 pegasus b so it was it was discovered during using this method it is a really close planet it's, it's what we call as a hot jupiter kind of planet so the next method is called transit method the so transit method is kind of like we are looking for shadows so when a planet moves in front of a star because of the planet the stellar the star light is blocked and that causes the brightness of the star to come down for the period the star passes in front of it so by measuring this we will be able to understand understand the radius of the radius of the planet and how much light is being blocked so that gives us an idea about the size of the planet so the first transiting planet to be discovered was st20945b uh then we also have so so but the thing we have to, like the smaller the planet the radius is the the dip in light is going to be really low so for example this is kind of like a jupiter sized planet so that causes more than 1% of the stellar light to drop but for planets which are like really small so that drop would come down significantly so here it is like in 1 percentage so here the drop in stellar light is going to be point as you can see point 0001 so it's like really really small drop so it's like really hard to observe this object the next method is called as direct imaging so in direct imaging what happens is that we kind of like cover the stellar light using some method so that would enable us to see the stars around it for doing that we use something known as we use a technique called as coronagraph so how does coronagraphy work so assume that there is a star and there are like planets going around that star so there is like two two planets going around that star so the stellar light from this planet comes to, towards earth we this like really far the star is really small we can't see it properly so our telescopes collect the star light and then we pass it through an object known as stellar light sorry uh, known as coronagraph so what this coronagraph does is that because you as you know that the stellar the, the planet light which is coming in so we have something known as a coronagraph mask so what what happens is that it is it is something which is blocking the stellar light so how it does the thing is that because the plan, the light from the planet would be coming at a slightly different angle than our stellar light so by using different techniques and deformable mirrors and mirrors that adjust the starlight and etc by playing around with this and adjusting our densities and playing around with deformable mirrors we are able to adjust our instrument in such a way that we can kind of like restrict the entire stellar light but we can only collect the planet light 
and by doing it multiple times and doing it for doing this doing this techniques continuously this, this we can we can kind of like observe the star so slowly by slowly by doing it properly the stars come into view and and with this method we can see the stars and then if we see the stars we can kind of like use use some method to observe the spectra of the stars and by observing the spectra of the stars we understand what are the elements in the and elements in this in this planet like whether they have methane oxygen water water vapor carbon dioxide etc etc so so that was direct imaging so there is also a method called micro lensing so it make use of the principle of uh uh what you call as like space time continuum so for example if there is an object with if there's a huge huge object which ha which has a huge background object and for example there is an object moving with star so this will cause a small dip in the starlight and by this method we can see whether there's a planet or not but this is not an easy method to observe because it is really hard to do so but to summarize we have the transit method which uses of uh, shadows radial velocity method which used for viewable micro lensing and direct imaging uh, so in some cases transit can also lead to the presence of another star because like based on transit we can calculate the period of period of a planet and then we find that the period is not what we expect it to have that would indicate that there may be some other planet that is also affecting the period of this planet and hence we can use that to find new planets so 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 far how many exoplanets have we discovered so so the first exoplanet or jupiter kind of objects was like like we we started knowing that there are these planets around but the first confirmed exoplanet stars was 2.3 1995 then slowly radial velocity method we started discovering few planets every year uh, then transiting planets discovered micro lensing planets discovered then what happens was in 2009 kepler was launched and that led to a huge discovery of planets like our number of planets that we know significantly grew then then what happens 2018 test telescope was launched to again find more exoplanets that kind of like increase the number of planets and as you can see because of these methods like now we are finding more planets with transit methods than radial velocity methods even though the radial velocity was the first method to discover it and so far we know more of, of more than 5000 planets and that count keeps on increasing every year so this this count is only till 2022 and like each year like we update this like with the number of more planets that we are discovering so and uh, so as you can see the detections are skewed because of kepler and telescope so kepler had two data releases that kind of like skewed the number of planets we have then there is still test telescope which is kind of like discovering new planets so these planets that we see are kind of like it kind of like really blew our mind away with all these exoplanets being discovered because they they look completely different from planets that we are used to so we are used to terrestrial earth like planets and then we are used to gas giants but what we find is that we find huge gas giants which are like significantly larger than jupiter we also see a lot of neptune neptune and neptune and uranus like planets we also see a lot of planets which are in between these two which are which are known as super earths so the this this the size and scale of things what we are seeing are like extremely different we see jupiter class planets moving around stars similar to sun at orbits much closer than mercury so they are kind of like blown away by these planets like there are like materials escaping from these planets we see planets which are really hot we see really cold planets uh, so the variety of planets that we see are extremely diverse as compared to what we see in solar system and that has kind of like made us rethink about our understanding of a planet's form planet formation planet evolution and how these planets evolved so how so how do we study this planet so basically to study this planet we made use of sunset in this planet so what do we mean by that so what happens is that if we observe a planet what happens is that in principle the light that coming coming from the star when you are observing a transit it passes through the atmosphere of the planet as well so different depending upon the properties of the atmosphere of the planet different wavelengths will pass through different parts of the atmosphere 
and then by looking at it, we'll be able to understand what happens in the atmosphere. So, for example, if if the atmosphere of the planet, in the planet, planet kind of like absorb the star starlight or modify the starlight, we'll be able to see that if there is no particles in the atmosphere that is like absorbing the starlight, that particular wavelength, starlight is passed through un unobjected or uncorrected. So, we'll be able to see that. If there are things that are blocking the starlight, like there are there are clouds or there are cases or something which is blocking the starlight, we'll be able to understand that by looking at it. So by looking at different by looking doing this, by doing spectroscopy of spectroscopy of the planet when they are transiting, we'll be able to study the atmosphere of the planet. And that will enable us to understand what all are the species present in the planets. And that kind of like led to detection of many species. So these are these are observations from uh, was there may be with James Webb telescope, which kind of like clearly did the detection of carbon dioxide, water, sodium, etc. So this is kind of like one of the first detections of confirmed detections of water, carbon dioxide, etc. in the atmosphere of these planets. So, so what are we actually looking for when we are studying this planet? So what we are looking for is called habitable zone. So habitable zone is that region around the star where we know liquid water to exist. So it's like at that particular distance, a particular distance, it's a familiar place for us. So it's similar to Earth as, as the distance from Sun to Earth is. So where the temperature is like okay for life to survive, there is like liquid water to survive. So so the tech, things are normal there. So we are looking for planets which are around habitable zone. So, and we have many examples of potentially habitable zones that we have discovered. <coughs> which are similar to that we have. But so far we have not found any life on these planets. But we will look for, we'll, we'll still look for these planets around sun-like stars, which are at the right distance. We are looking for planets as big as Earth, as heavy as Earth. We are looking for planets with magnetic field because magnetic field is also really important because it it, it kind of like plays an important role in our survival. We are looking for plants with liquid water because life as we know it requires liquid water. A planet with an Earth-like atmosphere, plate tectonics plays an important role in life as well. And also a moon because we find that moon plays an important role, role for sustaining of life on Earth. And that too and not too young. Not too young. It should be It should be slightly old. So we'll keep looking and all of you will be one of the first people to know, or one, you, you all may be the first people to find such a planet uh, around Sun. But what sh we shouldn't forget is nature is full of surprises. And what we expect to see may be completely different that, from that. Because even, even on Earth, we see that uh, planets kind of like, uh, life kind of like th survives in really harsh environments. We have, uh, we have microorganisms leaving inside uh, volcanoes uh, in the depth of the oceans where the pressure is really high in ice cap mountains. So, what the nature is, nature is full of surprises, and what we actually find may be completely different from what we expect. So, just to give another idea of how to be an astronomer. <coughs> so, after your school education, uh, in school, you this you will have to take physics, math, and chemistry, which is important for understanding how to be an astronomer. So then it's 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 a good idea to take bachelor's in physics, mathematics, and chemistry. Engineering also works. And depending upon your interest in whether you want to build the instruments or build satellites or build build telescopes or actually just do the observation and do, do the theory and do the observation and do the study, you can either do master's in physics, astronomy, or astronomical instrumentation. And then you should do a PhD in astro astronomy, physics, or applied physics, depending upon the university. But you can you can get involved now as well. So most of the cities in India have some form of astronomy clubs. Uh, most of the planetariums do sky watching and telescope building. Uh, it is also necessary to have some form of uh, coding skills, like software. Like, And I would emphasize that you don't have to pay to learn any of these. Uh, internet has all the resources to do learn uh, software coding for free. You can 
you can do you can do that for free you don't have to pay anyone to learn coding software uh, then you should you should be always be open to change because like what you learn would be new you should be ready to change your idea about what happens and based on new understandings you should learn and update every day uh, you should also be ready to accept mistakes and have patience because it's the same thing for example a transit of an earth like planet around a star will take one year so that means that you will be only able to observe it once in a year so if you have to observe it like and you need more than more than one observation to completely understand stuff so you would need at least three observations so so that is like three years so and as of now mostly astronomy works in teams so you will also need team skills writing and speaking skills uh to communicate your work to communicate your work to others to understand what you're seeing to get collaborations and develop your group so once you finish your phd uh you go into post doc position uh so it's like limited time position after that you actually go into positions at university or research institutes university positions are mostly research and teaching uh the observatory and research institute positions are mostly just research or you can go and work for space agency so outside of uh outside of this is what we call academy after that you can also if you are not interested in doing astronomy anymore but the things that you learned or the skills you have are really good for working in computer space industries computer science industries data science and aerospace uh that's all for now and i'll be happy to take your questions at a later stage thank you thank you for the wonderful elaborate session sir where you spoke from the scale of universe to solar system to planets variety and diversity of exoplanets next is the guidelines of the qna session on planets and exoplanets please pay attention on these important points qna session is scheduled at 8 o'clock pm on 3rd of march 2023 dr srijit will come live to answer your questions most of you may have questions but limited time restricts our speaker from taking all the questions vssf will shortlist few relevant and contextual questions that we receive moreover questions that are similar in nature have been clubbed to a single question our endeavor is to ensure that you get better clarity on the topic your questions should reach us latest by 12 pm on 3rd march 2023 only one question per student will be taken please post your questions on the attached google link thank you sir principals coordinators and students we shall see you at 8 pm indian time on 3rd march 2023